All right, everybody online can hear me all right? Yes, yes. sir. Doki. So we are going to write our first character driver. Um, I did have to make some uh, modifications to the code from the site I gave you. So we'll walk through my code and I already put it up on GitHub. I just put the link to my code on GitHub up on Slack. So if you want to follow it uh, along on your own machine, you can. Um, but I have this, this working right now. Um, so we'll, uh, let me, what am I doing? So we're in this first character driver folder. What I actually did is I just put my entire CSC 450 spring 2021 directory on GitHub. So as I add new stuff to it, just try to remind me to do my push to GitHub thing at the end. And that way it'll you always have the latest code. Um, Cause I think I mentioned this last time that there are definitely going to be situations where we type in some sample code that we, that we find as I'm trying to explain something and it breaks. Something's not working because some newer library is available or something like that. You gotta keep in mind Linux kernel development has been around for a while. Um, I will try to, um, debug that stuff as often as possible before coming to class. <laughs> but sometimes it'll be an exercise for the reader in class. But today's is debug. Um, and it wasn't anything major. I'll, I'll point out the, uh, the highlights as we, uh, as we go. Um, all right, so I created a new directory in here and I just called it first character driver. All right, and the only files I created in here are uh, uh, charge chardriver.c and make file. So only two things. All that other crap that's in there is the result of ca calling make on it. All right. Uh, everybody has access to this up on GitHub or if you, if you want it so uh, off of Slack. All right. So, and I want to go back to the, um, uh, actually I'll do it off of this. I do have it in the slides as well, but we were operating off of this site here and we referenced it a couple different is it this one there we go we referenced it in the notes a couple different times this file operation struct that looks terrifying right we haven't actually done anything with it yet but we've ref uh, at least i've scrolled to it we haven't really talked about it right okay i've scrolled to this guy all right so this is a, a scary looking struct that talks about the things you can do to files. I mentioned at the end of last class that we we're gonna start talking about the proc file system today. All right, and you'll see that as we kind of bump into it. So we have a whole bunch of things that are in here that you may want to do with something that is in your uh, proc file system. But the reality is, is GNU gives us a, um, a, a a shortened version of this is likely what you want to <laughs> what you want to do. All right. So notice here, here's a cut down version of that struct. So this cut down version says, you know what, you might want to read, write, open, and release. That sounds better <laughs> than this uh, uh, thing up here. Not that this is completely useless, but this is something that is significantly older. Um, not that when you wanted to have more granular control, it's when you needed to feed it additional information. Things in the kernel, especially modular kernels today are more streamlined. So we're able to get away with less. If we bump into an example where I can do a throwback, I will, but let's kind of focus on the, the simplified version for right now. Okay, so uh, I'm going to come back to this here in a few minutes, um, but we're ultimately going to be creating this. I'm going to walk through this in our code and see where this ultimately happens. Okay. Now, if you are on this site and you copy in this code from down here, this char dev, it doesn't quite work as advertised. So I've had to make some changes to it. I'll point out where I've made a couple of changes, not substantial but in a couple of a couple of places all right so first of all 
I needed to include this Linux schedule.h. Uh, it used to be included in the kernel, but things like that proc uh, file system, the uh, things like this file operations thing exist in there. And there's a couple other structs that are in there that we need. Um, and if so, if you don't have it in there, you'll get error messages related to mit some missing structs. In fact, I can I can demo that for you. So I'll go ahead and I'll just omit this line here for a second. And we'll come out here. Let me make sure I'm in the right directory. I am. I'll go ahead and do a make. And notice here it's saying that uh, um, the struct task struct it can't find. So inside of Linux scheduling.h, sketch.h is where some of these structs that it use um, that it uses are. You know, I just did a search on uh, Google for this, and it said, ah, newer versions of Linux have it in this uh, different header file. They just split the header file into two pieces, so it didn't automatically come with. Uh, I'm guessing it would have historically been in kernel.h. So they took some of the stuff out of the kernel, which would be microkernel esque of them. Uh, and so to give ourselves access to that, we need to have that guy in there. So now you'll see that it does build. All right, so let's keep trucking. So um, the other thing that I also had some issues with is this uh, ASM, and this is for assembly. Um, and it uh, um, gives you access to things inside the kernel. And uh, I had to link it's very similar to what we did before with the Linux directory, this guy right here. So in Ubuntu, there is not a folder called asm. It's called asm-generic. So if I do a history grep for asm. So the line I had to copy was slash lib slash modules, then our uname thing, slash build include, and it's asm dash generic and that gives us access to that guy but now what's interesting and you uh probably well you maybe didn't notice it in the code the folder well the symbolic link is to something called asm dash generic but notice that the include is just asm so asm dash generic is the uh linked thing but it's as opposed to some specific assembly like you could have asm dash i386 asm dash mips so on and so forth so asm dash generic uses whatever the I presume whatever the current architecture is of the uh of the system okay so that's what makes this work so the same thing we looked at in our previous module to get all of these things working we had to do that symbolic link for the linux module so that our make could build um if you know we to build that driver we need access to that so it either needs to be in our build path or we can just create a symbolic link to our current directory so that's what we did for linux and that's what we did now for asm generic okay now at the top, we have all of these prototype functions. And we would have talked about this in the CSC 300 class when we talked about header files that uh, historically C used the one pass compiler. Did we mention this last class, the one pass compiler stuff? Or this in this class, do you know what I'm talking about? No, you, I didn't mention it or you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> all right. so. Let me just give the quick uh, overview of that. So what, what's the purpose of header files? We've been including them to give ourselves access to other things, but what is a header file? Why write our own? Is it kind of, like, kind of like a high level view of what's going to be in your program? Okay. So a high level 
view of what is going to be in the program. I'm going to say this is kind of like an interface in Java. So when you, if you remember when we created interfaces in Java, you uh, have something that kind of looks like a class, but when you implement that interface, it forces you to write some of the, uh, um, the functions. Um, so it's kind of like an interface in Java, specifically in C. We used to have one pass compilers. Ultimately, this meant that when compiling, everything was done in a single pass. So situations where you had one function reliant on another function, let's say a situation where you had, well, I'm going to say it both ways. So in situations where you had one function reliant on another function, you had to have defined the other function before you could use it. In situations where you had functions that relied on each other, you were stuck. So now you have function A, which makes a call to function B, function B, which makes a call to function A, which function do you define first? You can't make it work, right? Each of them is dependent on the other. The fix was initially to prototype all the functions at the top of the code. Later, these prototypes were moved into header files. Now, the purpose of these prototypes, a prototype allows a one pass compiler to read in all of the legal symbols before any of the implementation. So the compiler can successfully do its job. So by prototyping functions at the top, you're not actually writing the contents of them. You're just writing the method header, the function headers. And then later on in the code, you're actually giving them an implementation. It's in the implementation where functions might call other functions. So if we've had all the functions and me, uh, initially said, I'm going to be writing these six things. This is what they're called. This is what parameters they take, stuff like that. If we do that up top, then we don't have to worry about the order in which they are uh, defined later on. All right, makes sense? Like the issue that exists here, why we're dealing with it? Okay. So up here at the top, and I'm not sure that any of these would have had this issue, um, but it's still good programming practice because um, it's... Uh, looking at a header file or even just looking at the top of this file with prototypes we kind of see hey these are the things that are going to be defined below right because when you initially look at a c program it can be a little intimidating you know they feel a little bit foreign to us there's structs and things like that it you know unless you step through it line by line it can just feel overwhelming okay so at least this says look we're going to have a function called a knit module we're going to have a function called cleanup module. We're going to have a function device open, device release, device read, device write. All these functions, you know, these two take no parameters. This one takes a couple. This one takes a couple of structs. This one takes a struct, a char pointer, another uh, struct type. Uh, well, size, actually, it's not a struct type. Size T is probably just a long under the hood. It's a mapped type. Um, uh, this is another type. This one's probably a struct. Um, any case, this gives you, these are the functions that exist and these are the parameters that you take. So if you run into any of these later on compiler, 
now you know what's legal and what's not so you don't have to scream that such and such was used before it was defined all right now we have a couple of macros defined these are just like hard-coded variables so our device name in this case so our example what we're doing here is we are creating a character device that we can read and read read from and write to um, actually we're in, I don't think we're implementing right here, but we'll see it when we get to it. I didn't test right at the very least, but I presume it, it works. So we can name it whatever we want, but we're going to name this guy char dev and ultimately it'll end up in our proc devices um, uh, directory. We will have to add it uh, there through a command that's given to us in uh, D message. And we'll see that when we get there. Um, Buffer length. So this is like for reading in a string. If you're going to send something, if you're going to write something to the device, the maximum it's going to let you write is 80 characters. Fine. Um, define some other variables here. Here's our file operations, our cut down version of this. All right. So this is us defining a um, our file operation struct called FOPS. And inside this, we've gone ahead and associated all the values. We've said that the dot read, let's call it a field, kind of like classes, the dot read field is equal to our function called device read that we've advertised we will be writing. This guy right here. Haven't written it yet, but we've prototyped it. Our dot write is going to be associated with device write, open, device open, release, device release. So this is us, well, you'll see it here in a second when we register the char device. This is us explaining the mapping of the things they expect from us and our actual implementation of those things. Make sense? All right, so now we have our init module. So notice that our init module is not part of these things. Why not? Why is init module not listed here? I think we had asked this question last class. Didn't I ask the question of what's a device versus a uh, um, module? Yeah, driver versus module. So all drivers are modules, but not all modules are drivers. So what we're dealing with here is this stuff is specific to how do we talk to character devices? The presumption is, is that a character device in a modern day Linux operating system would be installed as a module, but that's not part of what makes it a character device or not makes it a character device. It's a module, just like any of the other things we've written have been modules where we use the built-in ins mod and uh, uh, remove mod to uh, add them. So file operations, this guy only dictates what reading and writing and opening that file mean, okay? Whereas the module aspects, and NIT module, we expect to find something probably at the end here where this guy is actually registered, actually added to the system. And then we install the module externally, all right? So this is really nothing new. This is something pretty similar uh, to what we did before, although I'll talk about this here in a second. All right. Um, so init module, we have a major device name, whatever. If we have a problem registering character device failed, fine. Otherwise, we're going to print some info to the kernel that we see in D message. All right. So it says I was assigned a major number, whatever. Um, uh, so the, uh, to create a new dev file, so we've said that the way by the way that we will talk to a device is through well a device gets registered in slash dev. It then gets uh, picked up by slash proc. All right, uh, and we'll see this here in a second. So in here it says to actually create the file, we have to run this command make node. Was it two, two Ks, one K? 
make block or character special files. So this guy will create a special kind of node inside of a dev folder that will trigger a proc file to be created. Okay, so this isn't just a normal, I just created a file. The equivalent of this in Linux, uh, the equivalent of creating a file just in normal Linux would be called touch, T-O-U-C-H, and then just say the file name, that was created empty file. Okay, so this guy is creating something special that's going to get linked here. So in our code, we're just writing out some information that will remind us when we go and look at uh, um, our D message, it'll say, hey, here's the device name that was assigned to me when I registered my character device. So you might want to go ahead and do a make nod slash dev slash whatever that device name was. And then you also have to give it the, the major driver number. These are things that you pick up automatically when this character device gets registered. And then when we install our module, it lets us know that, hey, this is what we're dealing with here. If you want to be able to read and write from this guy, you have to go create this file. By the way, the device name we picked up was this guy. The major number is what was returned by register device. Okay, and we'll see examples of what the output looks like. It's just a number. It's like a unique identifier for this file on the system that we want to create. Well, it's a unique identifier for the character device. Our mechanism for talking to that character device is through the um, a file that lives in slash dev. All right. So this is just output to us when we install our module that will let us know what we need to do in order to actually communicate with this guy. We're to find our, how to create the walkie talkie and then how to use it. Okay. Clean up module just says, hey, let's go ahead and unregister it. Get rid of that character device. I actually don't know if it'll remove the file automatically or not. It seems like it should but I don't remember doing any cleanup in here myself. The hope would be that it removes it. Otherwise you potentially, if you do this stuff very often, you just abandon a whole bunch of files in your <laughs> slash dev directory. Um, I don't think there's a great reason why it can't, this can't be a thing. It should be able to, when you unregister, it should be able to go into slash dev and find the special file, whatever you name the file, should be able to find it uh, um, related to its device name. All right, so now down here, these are those methods that we advertised above that we were gonna write, okay? We said we were gonna write a file called device open. So this is if somebody opens the file, when is a file open? So you get a file on your computer. Do you have to open a file before you can read from it or write to it? Yeah, I got to open it first. Opening it lets you use it, right? Um, when does a file close? Probably after you write something to it, you close it so that, that whatever you wrote gets written in memory. Closing it puts it back to disk. If we're just talking about general file IO. So, when this device is open, what are we going to do? Notice here we have this static int counter. Now we talked a little bit right at the end of class and there were some questions about the multiple uses of the word static <laughs> in C++. Um, there is a kernel level static and then there's static like it's being used here. So static like it's being used here deals with, it's similar to how Java works um, in that how long does this variable last? This variable scope belongs to, in Java, we would say it belongs to the class, right? Static means something is owned by the class. Problem is, is in C, we don't have classes. <laughs> so we can say that static is a variable that's owned by the program, I think is the most accurate way of saying it. So as long as this program is running, this variable exists one time and will persist. 
okay? And we're using it as our counter here. The idea here is I'm just kind of giving you the, the, the ultimate goal. It's showing every single time I, I uh, um, read from the file, it's incrementing this counter, proving that, hey, you read once, you read twice, you read three times. I'm here, I'm still here, I'm able to count globally every single time you read for me. Completely useless uh, character uh, device, completely useless driver, but proof of concept, right? Okay, so this is a variable that exists one time exactly and its duration will be for the life of this program, as long as it's running as a module, in this case. Static would mean it's for the life of the program, period. It's not a module-based keyword. Just in our case, our program's running when we install that module. That kicks it up and not until we uninstall it does it stop running. So it would just sit there and count forever. Okay. So we get a little thing about whether the device is currently already open. That way you, this handles kind of race conditions for if you remember from the operating systems class, uh, you potentially, you know, we have a single file, right? In this case, we have one resource that multiple people might be interested in reading from. We are not going to allow more than one person to open it at once um, because when somebody opens it, they might be opening it for reading. We might be opening it for writing. And we don't want two people to be opening it, be able to open it at the same time for writing because the file will change potentially and which change will stick? The person who wrote last because they both loaded the same file into memory. They're both editing copies of that file in memory. And the first person who closes the file, that would get written to disk. The other one would overwrite that one with the contents they put in there. So this thing is like, hey, don't let more than one person open it at once. Chances are we're just doing quick reads and writes. So opening it is gonna be really snappy. We're just protecting against, uh, not even protecting very well. This is more like uh, we're not using any built-in operating system stuff for um, that we'll talk about at some point, like semaphores for protecting a resource. This isn't necessarily an atomic operation. An if statement around a um, device ID is not an atomic operation. So potentially you could have a race condition where two things could open this file if they happen to it switched off the CPU at the exact same time or pretty close and they're in between assembly instructions where one of the instructions got it half open but didn't completely open it, something like that. Not important for what we're doing here. All right, so once the device has been open, we're incrementing a counter, just how many times was it open. Um, we're gonna print out, I already told you this number of times Here's our counter. And notice this is the thing I always told you never to do, right? Embed a plus plus inside of a, when we talked about like probably in the Java class 250, we talked about uh, plus plus, in this case it would be plus plus counter versus counter plus plus. So if I say plus plus counter, and I say counter plus plus, what's the difference between these two? Yeah, they both incremented by one, but they're not equivalent. They both have a final result of having incremented them by one. So after line 94, counter will be one bigger than it used to be. After line 95, counter will be one bigger than it used to be. But the question is, when I embed it into something like this, where I'm saying, I, I told you this number of times, hello world, am I getting the original version of counter or the version after it incremented? Counter plus plus says, boil down to the current value and increment after, since the plus plus comes after it. Kind of remember this conversation now from couple of semesters ago, if I say plus plus counter, it will increment it first before giving you the actual value. 
Now, my argument is never write it this way. If you want the current value, put the current value in there. If you then want to increment it, hey, have at it. Counter plus plus, plus plus counter, counter plus equals one, counter equals counter plus one. I don't care how you do it. If you put it on its own line, it'll become one bigger than it used to be. Make sense? All right, so what's the idea here? Is I've been programming for a few minutes longer than you guys have. And this is a concept we've talked about before, but you can imagine if this isn't something you've dealt with, and keep in mind that when I learned this stuff, this was pretty common practice. But it's not really common practice today. I'm saying this is protecting you from yourself if you write it like that. Say what you mean. Don't do some sort of trick to save a line of code. It's one of those things where I've said, you know, nobody's impressed if you have one less line of code, but you don't really know what it means. Or worse, the person who reads your code next doesn't know what it means. Okay. So I'm never going to test you over something like this. I never did in any of the earlier classes or something like that. I'm just telling you from a programming perspective, knowing the reality, I think we also look at the inline if statements. That's another interesting example that could be uh, um, handy every now and then. When you get to a situation where this would be helpful, go and look it up then. If not, write it in a way that's crystal clear, even if it costs you an extra line of code. All right. So the idea here is, is that when we open this device, it's going to print out sprintf is part of the multiple uh, printf functions. Is sprintf, is that string printf? String, I guess it's formatted string. Printf works that way, but this case we're printing differently. We're not using just normal printf. Printf is to the standard I.O., which would be the monitor. In this case, we're probably writing to a log file. But we'll we'll see. All right. So this is going to print out somewhere the number of times you've opened this file. And if we have multiple people calling upon this, we know that we have a global counter that's owned by the module itself, not by a particular call to this function. All right. And then this guy tries to get a value from the module. So this is a function that we didn't write. It's a function that comes with module.h this guy. In fact, I'm guessing that this, let me just look up sprintf real quick. I think sprintf prints to a string, so it, it writes to the, the device. And then when we read from the device, Using that try, it gives us the actual uh, value that was there. Yeah, so this guy composes a string with the same text that would be printed if format was used in printf. But instead of being printed, the contents are stored as a C string and the buffer pointed to by string. So if we go back in here, notice I have this thing called message and message is so i'm writing to this string i'm printing to this string this output i'm then going to use that string um somewhere where does this module is that a hard coded thing inside of module.h
Yeah, I think so. I think this variable right here is something that came with module.h. It's how a module refers to itself from within itself. So we're kind of seeing pre-object oriented programming um, when something couldn't necessarily talk about itself because we didn't have instances of objects. All right, so this is what happens when we open a file. And let me look at what's that message pointer. Did we define that? Yes, so this is a global variable called message pointer. And when we get down and see read, I think we'll see what happens here. All right, I mentioned a few minutes ago that when does a file open? It's when we need to read or we need to write. All right, so we have a global variable that is owned by this program as long as it's run called a message pointer. Um, it is a string. That's a char pointer. I hate when they write it this way. That's a variable of type char pointer. This is a string. Okay, so what are we doing inside of open here? We're going to set message pointer equal to the string we just created right here, the address of it. We don't need to write the address of it here because message, I'm presuming we defined up here as this is also a char pointer. So message here, buffer length, I think we said 80. This line right here is the same thing as saying static static char pointer message, I'm going to call this guy message two, is equal to the char pointer version of malloc buff length. That guy. This goes and gets us enough memory to hold this many of these guys. And we're going to store it inside this. This uses more of an array syntax. This is equivalent in Java to saying static char message. Java is equal to new char, or new uh, char array buff line. That's the Java equivalent of that line. Make sense? So all these things are things we already know that just maybe feel a little bit more cryptic in here. So here, I'll comment that out. I'll comment this out. So see, you have those examples in there. Um, but they're building it kind of the quick and dirty way. Just say, look, give me some memory. Uh, and this is probably memory in um, uh, address, user address space that came with this program, rather than us talking to the operating system to go get new land that's somewhere out there unavailable. All right, so this is a temporary buffer we'll print a string to that could be up to 80 characters long. And then we will set our message pointer equal to that guy. And then when we say try module get this module that should try to read from it. We'll see that here in a few minutes. Device release. This decrements the number of elements that are uh, open. See, I mentioned here it's our next caller. This is us trying to like in a not great way, protect more than one person from opening the file at the same time. Okay, this is not a mission critical type situation. <laughs> They're basically saying, look, the worst that might happen is we might miscount by one, but it's pretty unlikely that we would have multiple users reaching this file anyways. So this is a very simplified version of, if it's already open, don't let them open it. Otherwise, when we release the device, we decrement device open, now it can be opened by somebody else. It's just using an integer. But the reality is, is incrementing and decrementing an integer does not happen atomically. It happens in more than one um, instruction on the CPU, which means other things possibly could happen in the middle. Make sense? Unimportant in this program, but more of an operating systems, uh, bigger picture thing where that 
if we're dealing with something life-threatening, want to take all necessary precautions to not let uh, two people have access to the same resource at the same time. All right, so that's what we do when we release and we call module put uh, when we do that. So this decrements the uses counter or else we'll never get uh, rid of the module. So the module only runs when we're opening or releasing it. Doesn't that seem like it shouldn't happen? I mean, it wasn't like a critical message, but shouldn't Slack like not give a pop up on the screen? Uh, if I'm in like, well, maybe Linux doesn't know I'm in presenting mode, I guess. It was Linux's pop up. I mean, it was our CUW faculty thing. We could have been talking about Brocker. We talk about you all the time. It's not good. All right. So keep going. So when we do a device read, when we're reading from that file, which we advertised above, we say, hey, if there's nothing in our message pointer, return zero. If, yeah, if nobody's uh, um, uh, done it before, return zero. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and load data into the buffer. So we're going to put to the user whatever is in our message pointer. Again, this is going to be buffer and then buffer plus plus. Nobody's impressed when you do this. Same thing with message pointer. Take the plus plus out of there. All right, so we're putting to the user, this says message pointer holds the base address of a string, right? I'm saying, give me the value that lives here. And what's the buffer? So buffer is this guy right here that was passed in to read. So the read function received as a parameter, kind of a, a conduit. This is like a, a walkie talkie that was passed in and said, anything you want the user to see, throw in here, okay? So they passed us this guy. A lot of times you'll see this word buffer and that effectively means, um, well, it's usually in a variable that's built to collect stuff. So it's kind of a naming convention that we've seen in a lot of old style C stuff. When you need to collect information, it gets put into a buffer to use for something else. So that, that variable name isn't important. We could have called that guy Woot if we wanted to, but naming it buffer adds some meaning to what we're likely using it for. It's something that we intend to fill up with something else. All right, so we're going to put to the user the value that lives at our message pointer. That was the thing that we uh, wrote when we opened the file. And we're going to put that into that buffer. And notice that here it says, um, this is copies from the kernel data segment where the module lives into the user data segment where buffer lived. So that variable buffer acts as the conduit between a variable that lives inside of uh, kernel space, in this case, message pointer, and a variable that the uh, end user has access to in user space, which was passed in as buffer. Okay, so it's how we uh, pass that stuff along. And notice here that this is saying while length, uh, so while this thing has a length, that is length is greater than zero. That's effectively what this says. Well, length is greater than zero because in C, Booleans are integers, zeros or ones. Okay, so while length is greater than zero and there's something in our message pointer, we're writing one character at a time. So we're writing a char to the base address of the buffer increment both of those. We're writing the next char to the next element, next bucket of the buffer, so on and so forth. So we're filling up with uh, filling up our buffer 
one character at a time. Does that make sense? Each time through we're decrementing our length, the number of characters that are in there. So we know when we need to stop. Because when this becomes a zero, zero and anything will be false. False and anything will be false. And then we're keeping track of the number of bytes that were read. Finally, we're returning an integer, which is the size of what was read. Keep in mind that the way it was written out to the user was through that buffer variable. That's the way it got to the user. User pet, when the user called read, and we'll see this next class, when the user called read, automatically it was passed in because device read requires these parameters. So automatically was passed in a buffer that this module could fill up with stuff that the user could then look in when they get, get it back. All right, so that's what read does when we do a device read. Device write, what does device write do? Device write says, sorry, this operation isn't supported. I told you earlier, I didn't think we wrote right. Okay, so it's staged, like, look, this would be a future entry, <laughs> a future thing. But right now, it functionally will allow you to try to write something. And how do you think it's passed in through this buffer? User wants to get something from user address space into kernel address space. They have to go through a trusted function. The module has said, ah, I trust this guy. Go ahead and send me a, a char pointer and I'll write it possibly with some oversight, kind of like a setter and getter in Java, right? So this is like a setter, if you will. You know, you want to write something to the file? Tell me what you want to write. Tell me how long it is because arrays in uh, um, C don't know their own length. Um, any offset, and then here's a um, pointer to the actual file. But this guy then put, uh, prints out in uh, red, as we saw before, that I don't support this. All right, questions about the high level of going through that. Do we roughly kind of get what's going on? Bare bone structure of what a driver is. We haven't gotten to the point of uh, installing the module or uh, reading from the file, uh, but I can kind of give you a, a foreshadowing thing here. Um, well, I think I can actually do a uh, message pipe to tail. I think it's called um, cat slash dev slash char what? Char dev. So I already told you six times, seven times, eight times, nine times. So every time I read from that file, it's incrementing that global variable and it's spitting something out. If I were to write to that file, echo woot to slash dev slash uh, char dev, right? It's gonna give me that feedback. Um, oh, hold on, I wrote that wrong. Echo woot, but that'll put it to the screen. Redirect it to char dev. Should have worked. Because Echo puts something to the screen, I'm redirecting it to dev, uh, char dev. It should have read it in and give us the pushback saying it, this doesn't, uh, uh, maybe I didn't change the permissions for that file. That had to be it. Exercise for the reader for next time. 
<laughs> so next time we'll come back, no homework for Wednesday. We'll come back, we'll finish looking at how to install this, how to create that dev file structure, uh, and then we'll start making some adjustments. Questions, comments, concerns, bribes? Yeah, it, it, uh, it catenates what's in there. So if I, for instance, if I say this, if I say cat uh, make file, it'll just spit out the contents of my make file. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not like a driver module specific thing. It's if I do man cat concatenates uh, files and prints out in the standard output. Yeah, it's just a plain Jane Linux command. All right, I'll see everybody on Wednesday. It was getting fun. Oh yeah. Or you know it will be doing accelerated graphics and It'd be ridiculous. I thought you were coming by after class for me to fix your GitHub. Oh, I have to go to a doctor's appointment. Oh, so you, you got it fixed or didn't get it? Uh, no, what it's doing is it's not uploading my uh, my SRC file. I did it exactly how I did it in the tutorial. I have like two hundred people trying to help me, but I just didn't upload that into the code. Did you try sucking less? Yeah. <laughs> <Did> I, no. <laughs> you didn't try that part. No, no. <laughs> I'm guessing you were eating turkey bacon while you were doing this. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's been yeah, it's a personal trauma. Lucky so, guess. I named so many variables in my